But this question of fear, we're all afraid of it. And there are things in relationship to this fear that you and I have to recognize, that if you trust in God and let Him be your guide and strength, you won't have that fear. And your fear is in relationship to your trust. As your faith in God gets stronger, your fear dissipates. And as your faith in God gets weaker, your fear arises. You want to have fear dissipated and removed? Then you rise up and hold up the name of the living God and look to Him to undertake for you, and He will. It's our faith that brings victory. It's our faith that casts out fear and enables us to put our trust in the blessed Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We will worship the man of Galilee who went to a cross 2,000 years ago. And no one can take his place. No one will intercede or interfere. We will not permit it. And so it is we have faith without fear. Well, good morning and welcome back. Uh, it's hard to imagine that that might be the last time you've heard that little bump, sermon bumper, uh, as I don't know what we'll do when we're outside, but uh, it's been one that I've liked. That also means, by the reason I'm saying that, is because we're coming near the end of the series. If you remember uh, what's ha- all that's happened, you, you're now at this point where you, uh, we have coming what we call the conclusion. Um, you know, Haman uh, rose to power and issued this decree to annihilate the Jews. This is stuff that we have gone over in the past several weeks. Uh, the, the plot becomes known. Mordecai challenges Esther to do something about it. And so she orchestrates this plan in order to, to tell the, ask the king to intervene. And, uh, and so uh, in that process, uh, as she delays and hesitates, God orchestrates this amazing way to humiliate Haman. Uh, and then he ends up being hung on the very gallows he was going to kill Mordecai on. And, and then so Haman is now dead, and the good guys won. That's kind of where we are. Uh, and so this is the, typically the part of a story that we call the denouement. Uh, I think I'm saying that right, but uh, this is the word. You don't say the T, and I'm not sure if you even say the N, but it's denouement, it's, and it's, it's a French word to just kind of describe the conclusion of a story. And it's the typically, you know, it's, it's, it's the code word for the boring part of the story. Uh, I, I know, I know. It, 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 it's it's predictable. It's it's supposed to be predictable. It's it's kind of how at the end where that you just need to have everything wrapped up, tie up all the loose ends, make sure that you know all the questions people might still have are answered, and just wrap it all up happily ever after. Make sure everything is is just is is finalized and done. Usually it's 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 very predictable typically, but you have to have it to give people closure. And so here we are in the denouement of Esther, or so you would think. You know, as we look in this, beginning of chapter 8, like I said, Haman's dead. Uh, Mordecai and Esther are victorious over their enemy, and we're at this place now where it kind of is coming back to to the this Wrapping things up, tying up all the loose ends. So you see in Esther chapter 8, verse 1, it says, On that day King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, and Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai, and Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. So a lot of this is, you know, it's, it's, it's almost feel like it's, it's um, what you would call just, it's going through the narration of just telling you what you already kind of know. It's just telling you now that, you know, uh, Mordecai and Esther have taken over Haman's home, and, you've, you, and, and now Mordecai is going to be set into the place where Haman was. And, and so you kind of like, it's, like I said, it's more theatrical. It's what you're 
You're just being told. And you even see that in the next part, which I call the throne room, throne room scene. Because uh, if you remember, you know, one of those movies, we, iconic movies when I was growing up was Star Wars. At the very end of it, in the denouement of Star Wars, there was this throne room scene with the great music. You know, bum, 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 bum. You, know the, you know what I'm talking about, the great song at the end where, uh, you know, Han Solo and Luke are walking down Chewie and, and they're getting their medals and Princess Leia is just kind of smiling and everyone's just happy. And, and so here you are in the throne room scene of Esther, you know, of where she herself now is literally in the throne room. And like I said, a lot of this is theatrical because the stuff like you would, you're going to sit there and go, well, I thought that was already done. Well, kind of it was. It says, then Esther spoke again to the king and she fell at his feet and wept and pled with him to avert the evil plan of Haman, the Agagite, and the plot that he had devised against the Jews. Remember, Haman's already dead. And so now she's saying, avert the plan. And you know, you, kind of, you seem like, oh, of course, uh, they won. And so when the king held out the golden scepter to Esther, Esther rose and stood before the king. And there's that part where you're like, wait, didn't he already do that? Well, this is kind of ceremonial now where he's holding out the scepter because that's what you do. But it's kind of a way of saying, I approve of you. And she said, if it pleases the king and I have found favor in his sight, and if the thing seems right before the king and I am pleasing in his eyes, let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadetha which he wrote to destroy the Jews who are in all the provinces of the king. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? And then King Hashur said to quit. Well, and so at this point, you, you kind of get this notion that is basically saying, can, we're going to formally announce that everything that Haman was about and done is over. We're going to take it all back. We're going to erase him from the story. And, and foil his plot. We're going to show that he was not victorious. And then it says, And then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and to Mordecai, the Jew, Behold, I am giving Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged them on the gallows because he intended to lay hands on the Jews. But you may write as you please with regard to the Jews in the name of the king and seal it with the king's ring. For an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring, cannot be revoked. Now this is where you, if we had sound effects, you'd hear like the record scratch. That, that, that passage right there, there's a lot in there, and you're sitting there, and there's a little part of you that's going, wait, what? You know, it, it sounds nice. It sounds like king is giving Esther what she asked for, she had asked this, like, to, to revoke, to actually call off, to, to rescind the plans of Haman. And the king says, well, here's his house. And, and you know what? Here, take the ring that he had, and then you can do your own thing with it. And I hung him on the gallow, by the way. He's dead now. But remember, she asked for him to take back, to revoke the, the decree that he had sent out, and he says, ah, I can't do that. For a decree, an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. Now, so that means that the decree, the edict for people to annihilate the Jews still stands. And it's still on the books, and it cannot be taken off the books. You know, so like I said, you kind of get me where you're seeing this idea, like your head scratching a little bit. You're like, wait, wait. So, so what? You, you're not taking it away? We won, right? Remember? You know, shouldn't this be different now? Shouldn't you just? Now, this made me think of uh, there's an old meatloaf song. I don't know. You guys know meatloaf. Some of you do. Some of you don't. Horrible name of an uh, uh, artist, but some people, he actually had some pretty good songs. But he wrote this song, I think in the 90s, that uh, was just confusing. Because uh, it would say, I would do anything for love. I would do anything for love. I would do anything for love. I mean, very, this song that's like, you know, making it sound like anything. And this, but then he says, but I won't do that. 
And he never explains what that is. But you're just like wondering, what? Wait. So I think King Ahasuerus is a little bit like meatloaf here. He's like, I will, I've given you this, and I'll give you this. And I, but the one thing you want, you can't do that. Now, I'm being a little unfair because I'm sure there were reasons why edicts by the king that were sealed by the king's ring could not be revoked. I'm sure there was legitimate reasons there. And he does give Esther and Mordecai permission to do whatever they want in his name. But yet, this is not what we would have expected. Like I said, if this was just a story and not real life like it, like it is, if this was just some story, you would expect at this point of the story for them to undo all the evil plans that Haman had kind of devised and that he would just kind of make everything right because that's how you wrap up a story and tie up all the loose ends. But yet, here we have this kind of curveball thrown where he says, I'm not going to revoke that order, but I'm going to give you the ability to do whatever you want to kind of combat it. And you have to sit there and ask, why? Why not just take it away? Why not just remove it? What does it mean? Especially when you look at this, that it's in God's Word. What does it mean for us as we're reading the story and saying, why isn't it just concluding Haman's lost. The Jews won. Why, why can't we just say all's done now? Yet there's something more, I think, for us to gain from this. It's almost a second climax in this, in this story. And, and you see it takes an odd turn almost immediately. The shocking part about this, what happens next, is that it's it, remarkably similar to what has already happened. If, if you look at what the, the decree that Mordecai comes up with as he takes the ring and he writes a decree in order to thwart Haman's decree, it sounds a lot like Haman's decree. In eight, chapter 8, verse 9 to 12, it says, The king's scribe were summoned at the time of the third month, which is the month of Sivan, 23rd day, and the edict was written, according to all that Mordecai had commanded the Jews, sent to all the provinces, and he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus, sealed it with the king's signet ring, sent the letters by mounted couriers, riding on swift horses. It goes on, it says, uh, the, 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 so the king's service, uh, so the letter, uh, oh, sorry, saying that the king allowed the Jews who were in the city to gather and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any armed force or of any people or province that might attack them, children and women included, and to plunder their goods on one day throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. So if you put up the next graphic, you'll see that there's these, these things that are in this passage. Scribes are summoned, name of the king sealed with a ring, destroy, kill, and annihilate, sent by couriers, to plunder their goods on this one day, which sounds a lot like what Haman wrote in chapter 3. Chapter 3, it says, Then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month, and an edict according to all that Haman commanded was written to all the king's satraps and governors, provinces, officials, peoples, every province in its own script and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces, with instruction to destroy, to kill, and annihilate all the kings, all the Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day on the 13th day. So when you look at this, you begin to sit there and go, wait, wait, what? So when this power is reversed, and now instead of Haman the Agagite being in power, it's now Mordecai the Jew who's in power. Is Mordecai just like Haman? Where he would he's going to do and de- issue a decree that is almost verbatim, the same as Haman's, now just in reverse. There are some parts in there, this should make you kind of a little uneasy. But there are some key differences, and let me explain why he wrote it this way, to help us understand. Uh, Because first off, yes, it is almost verbatim, the same as Haman's decree, just in reverse. But the key differences are is that the Jews 
are only allowed to do these things to defend their lives, to anyone who attacks them. And what you find as you read on is you realize that even though the decree did mention that they had the permission to annihilate not you know, just those who attacked them, but women and children and to plunder their goods, which would make you a little uneasy, the Jews never did that. And you go and read the story, the Jews only killed the men who attacked them. They didn't go after their families afterward, and they didn't plunder their goods. But yet the decree mentioned those things, that they had permission to do those things, and I honestly think probably to drive fear into the hearts of people who might actually have the thought of attacking them. And narrow, as the, it's kind of as a, to, to be a, a um, you know, to dissuade, dissuade people of taking this choice, to kind of be a, a way of saying you know, a deterrent of some sort. Now, the narrative also emphasizes that Mordecai's decree was even, I think, a little bit more weighty than Haman's decree because, you know, it says like Haman's was sent out by couriers. Mordecai's was sent out by couriers mounted on horses, swift horses that were used in the king's service. It kind of really goes into the description about how apparently it wasn't just sent like U.S. postal mail. It was sent like FedEx, you know, kind of this idea that there was a little bit more weight to it more importance to it. And the couriers went out hurriedly for Haman's, but in Mordecai's, they went out with like an urgent hurry, urgent haste, almost a terrified haste. And so the, the, the passage does give some weight to Mordecai's, but there are similarities there. And it sets up this very weird day on Adar the 13th. Adar is the 12th month of the calendar, but yet it's also kind of, it's more like in March, uh, according to our calendar. But either way, I, I'm sure it was a Friday because it's just a weird day. Uh, Adar the 13th will be the day when these two decrees kind of meet. And I have to kind of put the perspective. So they're, both decrees are still standing. One says that you have permission to kill, destroy, and annihilate every Jew. And take whatever they have. It's yours, if you want it. And the other decree says they have permission to gather and defend themselves and destroy you in return if you try it. Now, since both decrees are written under the king's name and sealed by the king's ring, they're both law. Therefore, saying in a way that no one's going to intervene. The army's not going to stop you. You're not going to be arrested for this. There's going to be no consequences officially or legally because of this day. This is going to be kind of this a free-for-all, a day in which there will be no repercussions other than what you do to each other. <laughs> you know, it's, I already mentioned how I feel like Esther, you know, Hollywood owes Esther a lot of money because they've just stolen parts of the story to write things like Cinderella and other things like that. And this is, this Adar the 13th, this, this 12th month of the year, the 13th day, is basically the basis for these movies called The Purge. I don't know if you've heard of them. I've heard of them, never seen one, but I guess they're popular because there's three movies and there's a TV series. And so, but I know the premise and it fits this almost perfectly because in this movie, apparently there's one day where you can do whatever you want. Uh, they're, they're, that's like a lawless day. You can kill your husband. You can rob a store. You can do whatever you want. There will be no consequences to your actions on this day. And it kind of like, it's a day in which everyone just lets out the awful side of themselves. And at least it shows that this will be a, an awful day. Because I think we're seeing, when you do remove the law, what happens? We see that people don't become nicer. People don't become more civilized. Things deteriorate rather quickly. And so here we have this day in which people who hate the Jews will have permission to do whatever they want to the Jews. And the Jews will have permission to fight back without the army or anyone interfering. 
Now, there should be this you know, clause is that I think that people realize that Haman had been killed. And Mordecai was now in the second highest position. Because the text does clearly see that people kind of saw the winds of change. They saw that the winds were blowing in the direction of Jewish favor. But yet it's pretty clear that so that they were favoring. Esther chapter 8, 17 says that in every province, every city, wherever the king's command and his edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews and a feast and a holiday. And many of the peoples from the country declared themselves Jews for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. So some people realized that, you know, if I'm not going to get caught up in this, I want to be on the right side. And so people became Jewish. I don't know if they actually converted or if they just pretended or whatever it is. There were people who obviously saw that the Jews were going, were favored in this one because of Mordecai. Esther 9.3 says, All the officials of the provinces and the satraps and the governors and the royal agents also helped the Jews for fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. And so they don't intervene, but they assist. And they're, they're kind of saying, Jews, whatever you need, we're there for you because we want to be on the side of the winner. So like I said, this bizarre day in which we have these two groups that are pitted against each other without any repercussions. Intri- I mean, intriguing story. Now, as intriguing as a story as it is, you have to sit there, you know, besides saying this is a cool movie plot, what is the point of setting up this day where these two groups are going to battle? And when you think about it, and like I have, I really have wrestled over this, is why in the world wouldn't the story, why wouldn't God just have it where the king revoked the order? Why set up this day of battle, this whole, you know, why wouldn't the king just, you know, why wouldn't God just move in the king saying, for this one place, I'm going to make an exception and I'm going to revoke an order that I had given. The, the lesson, I think, comes in the fact of the unexpected. This is not what we expected, but there is a message here for us. Because let me, let, me, let me just go, go through this. So, so there's this group, there's this fear that we've been talking about all these fears that's been hanging over the Jews' head all the time that Haman was in power, probably even before that. This fear of being destroyed by uh, a foreign country in which they live. And they could have avoided it. You know, they could have just, the king could have revoked the decrees and, and the order, the day where people are given permission to attack the Jews is rescinded, and so there will be consequences if someone does that. They could have avoided the whole scenario of having to fight it out. But the truth is, is that the people who hated them would still be there. They may have avoided the day, but the the lingering cloud of fear would still be there. What happens when another Haman rises to power who wants to destroy us? What will happen if someone, you know, if Mordecai, when Mordecai dies, and somebody else steps into his shoes. There's that sense of the, avoiding it does not remove the fear. Secondly, if, let's say the king had said, you know what, I can't remo- revoke the decree, but I will stand in the gap, and I will guard you, and I'll order my, my armies to defend the Jews. Well, that would have solved the situation too, but yet you understand that they still had not conquered the fear. It was still there. There was just a shield of protection around them called the Persian Empire. And who knows if one day they're going to change their mind or say, you know what, it's not worth it anymore. We no longer feel like protecting you is something that we value. It's just interesting to me that by the story going the way it does, it It forces the Jews to fight their own battle, to conquer their own enemies, to face their fears themselves and not let the fear remain. I think Esther 9.1 sums up kind of the whole point of what's going on here. It says, now in the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar on the 13th day of the same when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out on, every, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped 
to gain mastery over them. So here's this, these enemies are hoping to, to, you know, just kind of force themselves to overpower and control the Jews. It says the reverse occurred. And the Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. This, in this odd turn of events, because of this strange purge-like day that has been decreed, the Jews are forced to face their enemies and defeat them. And it brings up this idea of a, until you or me or whoever faces their enemies, they will have mastery over you. It reminded me of a passage. It's not the same word, unfortunately, but it reminded me of a passage, and I think there are echoes of it in this. In Genesis chapter 4-7, one of the first times that God is dealing with, with sin and, the, and Cain, uh, Cain and Abel, the two brothers, before Cain became a murderer, God could see it in his heart, and he said to him, If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. It desires is contrary to you. It wants to master you. But you must rule over it. There is this reality, this battle that we all face, whether it be sin or troubles or fears or whatever it is that's going on in our lives, we either let it have power over us or we choose to conquer it and show that we have power over it. If we just avoid it, it doesn't go away. Just like the enemies of the Jews would not have gone away if this Adar the 13th hadn't happened. They would have still just been there, just kind of simmering under the surface, maybe not apparent to the eye. They would have still been there. One might... I was actually quite surprised when you read this that apparently that the hate for the Jews was so strong that even though people kind of knew that the Jews were favored in this one, there are people, there's still apparently still thousands and thousands of people who still decided that they were going to try and take advantage of the Jews, to destroy them, to annihilate them. And I, I, I wondered whether it was like, you know, Maybe I'll get away with it. I just want, I'm, I just want this neighbor. I'm not, I don't care about all the Jews. I just want to kill the neighbor who's got a piece of property that I want, you know, whoever. To, but there were people, all of the, even though the tide had already turned, who still had it out for the Jews. Even though they knew that, I mean, like I said, so the fear or the threat did not go away. And I think our fears are similar. Avoiding them does not make them go away. It just keeps them in hiding, uh, and keeps them waiting for that moment when you are not on guard, and they can take advantage of you, and they can kind of move in and make, their, make it the, the, the issue, take advantage of you. Delegate, uh, helping, hoping somebody else might take care of your fears for you also doesn't make you victorious over them. If someone else is the, deals with all of our problems all the time, and we hope that somebody else will intervene or that somebody else will, will be the one who beats those fears for us, they still remain because when that somebody else is gone, the fear comes right back. The only way to conquer our fears or anything that seeks to master us is to face it ourselves. To, to deal with it ourselves, and it isn't the easy way. I get it. I would rather, because for ease, avoid the situation or, or hope that somebody else deals with it instead of me. But yet, if I want to be free of this fear, if I want to be victorious over this fear, I have to be the one to face it. I have to be the one to decide I no longer want to let this have power over me. There are a few things that I see in this passage that I realized about facing our fears that probably go against maybe what we commonly assume or think. And I want you to see them too. 
First off is when we do finally choose to face our fears, not to avoid them, not to hope somebody else deals with them. When we decide that we want to be victorious over our fears, our struggles, our sins, whatever it is, we don't have to do that alone. I think oftentimes we think of the, that that kind of battle is something that we have to face in isolation. Uh, the truth is, is that I think what commentators will say is probably the key to the Jews' victory in this was not that they had massive numbers. They weren't. They were not. They were a small little minority group, but that they were given permission to gather and defend each other. So they were given permission to kind of create militia. You can understand that in a kingdom, you know, just a, a people group to form their own little mini army would be frowned upon. But yet the Jews were given permission to do that, to defend themselves. And in doing that, I think that they were able to fend off their enemies, to destroy and, and beat their enemies. And so you got to think, so there's that neighbor who says he wants to take advantage of his neighbor and maybe take his land and property and when he goes to do it, his neighbor actually has a lot of friends there with him to defend him. So there's a sense that when we seek to conquer our fears, it's not something we need to do in isolation. Actually, it's better when we do it together. One of the most worst mistakes we can make is to try to face a challenge alone. Maybe it's a personal struggle. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's just a person in your life who you're struggling with. Regardless there is, there is wisdom and strength when we surround ourselves with other people who can help us fight that battle. And I honestly am going to sit here. I'm going to call out the Christian community on this because sometimes I think this is where we are the worst. We do not fight battles together. Oftentimes people fight battles alone because they're afraid to let other people know that they're struggling or have a fear. You know, sometimes we pretend everything is fine when inside it is not. It's, we, we, we make the choice to rather suffer with our, our struggles, our sin, our fears, than, to, to, than the shame of possibly being known that we have them. So I'm just going to say it. We all have them. Every single person has their struggles, has their fears, has those areas where they are weak, and feeling defeated. So let's not pretend that we don't. Because we do need each other to know that in order for us to have the strength and the wisdom to beat those enemies. We pretend to be victorious over our enemies sometimes when, when in reality, it's just pretend. Because we're not honest. And our fears still have control over us even though we pretend they don't. But if we're open with each other and we rely on each other and we work together, we can actually conquer our fears and conquer that shame that comes with it. There's also this sense that, the, that I realize in this and how the Jews battled this. Not only did they win victory together, but they, the, the fear of the threat, the threat against them actually ended up being far less than, than they would have maybe worried about or thought. Esther 9, chapter 2, or chapter 9, verse 2 says, The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all the peoples. And so here you have this, this day where the enemies of the Jews are pit against the Jews themselves who can defend themselves. And it ends up being very one-sided. And the Jews have decisive victories across the entire kingdom of Persia. You know, we don't, we don't hear of any Jewish losses, but we hear of like 75,000 who died, who tried to take advantage of the Jews and died in response. I honestly think this is the same often of our own fears. Now, I don't want to belittle anything. or Our struggles, our fears, our sin, I don't want to say that they're they're not really there. I know they are there. And I don't want to say they're not challenging because I know they are challenging. But sometimes they're more challenging in our minds than they are in reality. And we use our fear of them 
or our thoughts that we cannot beat them because they're so big, so strong, so powerful. We use that fear to justify not doing anything. Because if we do something, then, you know, well, we'll just, we'll just get destroyed. And yet when the, the Jews were forced themselves to face their enemies, they destroyed their enemies. And I hope that gives us hope to realize that sometimes facing your fear, especially when you do it with others, you know, leaning on God's truth, when you, when you do it with others, sometimes you're going to find that you can conquer them much more easily than you could have ever imagined. It's oftentimes our fear of the fear itself or our fear of the addiction or the struggle or whatever it is that makes us defeated before the battle ever began. You know, it's like Winston Churchill said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. I mean, I think that is so true where oftentimes fear itself is crippling. Yet if we actually are forced to find battle it, confront it, it is not nearly as powerful as we thought it to be. There's this Christian author that I really enjoy. He writes these neat stories. He wrote it this way. He says, everything gets harder if you start going on and on about how hard it is. If you want to build something up as insurmountable, impossible, as something that cannot be overcome or beaten, then it might actually become like that in your life. But yet God's word tells us all the time there's nothing impossible for God. That God has always given us a way out of any scenario, any problem. And so I'm going to ask you to trust him. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but if we actually seek to want to find freedom and victory, and he often grants it to us if we just pursue it. But the hard reality is sometimes we want our obstacles or fears to seem stronger than they are so we can justify not conquering them. But yet in this story, we see the Jews are forced to face their fears, and they have a great victory. I already kind of mentioned this last little point, but you saw this idea of doing it together. You know, to, to realize your fears are not as big as you maybe think they are. And also this sense that when you fight them, you can fight them with honor. You know, as I mentioned, in Mordecai's decree, the Jews were given permission to fight just as dirty as the, the ones, those who hated them. They could have killed women and children. They could have plundered their goods, but yet what you find is that never happens. Text explicitly mentions that those who were killed, in verses, uh, chapter 9, verse 6, in Susa, the citadel itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. No women and children mentioned. Later on, it says that, that they, they not only destroyed all these people, but it says the 9-10, it says that they also killed the ten sons of Haman. I didn't want to go through all their names. The son of Hamadetha, the enemy of the Jew. But they laid no hand on the plunder. It actually said three times that they, they laid no hand on the plunder. Basically saying, you know, obviously the motive for some of the people who wanted to kill the Jews was to take their stuff. And so what the Jews made sure to do is that our, their motive for destroying those who tried to kill them was not to take their stuff, was to defend their lives. They made it very clear that their motive was a good and noble one versus a selfish and greedy one. When they had, the, they had, they had permission, remember, they had permission to do all of that, but they decided not to. They decided to fight with honor. Uh, we often forget this. And if someone wants to sling mud at us, we sling mud back. If someone's angry with us, we get angry back. We fight fire with fire. You, you know, all, all the terms. But yet, that's not the way it has to be. When we face those things that we struggle with, we don't have to become or stoop down to their level. We can decide to fight in a godly way, still fighting, still victorious, but yet not compromising our own character in order to do so. And so you see, in this scenario, 
The Jews are forced to fight their enemies, but they learn how to be victorious over them by banding together, by seeing that their enemies aren't stronger than them, and by making sure that they maintain and with their own honor and their own values and character in the process. Now, I, for one, am grateful that this little twist happened and as the book of Esther seems to be concluding, where you think that things are going to wrap up nicely, and all of a sudden there's this, this you know, purge-like day where the king does not revoke the decree, and there's this battle and this whole thing, because, because it shows us, just like the Jews, that you, you, sometimes you need to face your fears, your enemies, your struggles, in order to be victorious over them. Actually, you should always pursue to face them. Not avoid them. Not hope that somebody else addresses them. John 16, is not up here, but it'll say, it says that in this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You are going to have challenges in this world. But Jesus has already said that he's victorious over it. And I think that we ourselves often are challenged with the, the thought of, or the reality of choosing whether we want to just be victorious in death when we're in heaven and we're finally free of all of this, or do we want to start living victoriously, evenly, victoriously even now? Because that option is available. You can be, live a victorious life even now, but in order to do so, you have to face your fears head on. You can't just hope they go away. That is not how you live a victorious life. And instead of avoiding them, instead of hoping they'll go away, I want to encourage you. Gather with some other folks to fight, this, fight that battle with you. Make sure that you believe you can win. You know you can win. And also make sure that you do so in a way that you can, can look at yourself in the mirror and say, I did it with, by maintaining my character, maintaining my honor. Fight in the right way. Let's pray. Lord Father, thank you so much for this the privilege it is to be under your word. Lord, every week I hope that your word comes alive. Hope that we see that in it there is so much good truth the stuff that we need to hear in life. Lord, you've given us all that we need in it. And I ask, Lord, that we would read it with ears just attentive to know what you want us to hear from it. Lord, thank you for giving us wisdom to live this life. And I pray, Lord, that we would pursue victorious living, that we would never give up the fight. We would know that you want us to be free and alive in life. Not just the next, but this one too. So give us victory over our enemies and our fears, our struggles, Lord. Help us to know that you want that for us. And even when you push us to do it yourself, help us be grateful, Lord, that you're making us face the fears that have control over us. So thank you, God, for all that you do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.